to the channel. Now this big lump is a beautiful piece of seasoned oak. It's about a foot and a half long uh, and about eight or nine inches wide. Uh, and we're gonna have a fair amount of fun with it, I think. Uh, now, I want to do a vase again. I know I've just done a vase, but I'm in the mood, so I wanna try it. Uh, but we're going to do a couple of things I've never done much of before. We're going to do a bit of texturing and we're going to try a new uh, ebonizing product which I've been given to see if it's any good. It's unlike any I've seen before so we will see how we get on. Now first of all we have, which end this end, we've got some cracking there. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a, a slice off here with the chainsaw to see how deep that cracking goes. Now this is going to be the bottom of the vase I think because that's where the most of the wood is. So right we'll get that cut off and see what that looks like. Okay I've taken a couple of cookies off this end but we still have cracks in there and these still seem to go in a reasonable way. So I'm going to make a slight adjustment and that side is now going to be the bottom of this uh, this vase. So first thing we're going to get it's on the lathe between centres. Uh, we're going to turn it round, create a tenon on this end and then we can start playing around with the shape. Okay now I've got it as close to the centres as I can on each end. Now we are out of balance that's mainly because we've got this large uh, branch area here so we are going to have to deal with being a little out of balance at the start. Get this nice and tightly screwed down to keep us safe. Make sure it's well locked off. Right, I'll put the controls over this side. I'm going to turn this on and see how bad the vibrations get at the lowest speed. If it is too bad, they're going to have to change the gearing and go down to the, the bottom gear to start off at a slower speed, but let's give it a go here. So Hooch, hold on. Okay, well. Right, we've got a little bit of a wobble, but that's up to 630 RPM, so that's not too bad. Now, with this bit here being end grain, I'm not going to start turning this round with my uh, roughing gouge. Uh, I'm going to start off with a bowl gouge. I'm going to take this down very, very slowly, very carefully, keeping an eye on the position of the drive spur and the tail stock, making sure everything's nice and tight because I do not want this thing flying off at me. I'm obviously going to be wearing face protection, but still, that would hurt. Okay, face protection on, sharpened up, woolly hat on because it's cold. And let's get rid of this bit on the side so we can feel a little bit safer. Some of the chippings there were uh, stinging a bit, so glove on. I'm just going to go and sharpen up again, take a quick breather, and then we'll carry on. Okay, I'm not too worried about these cracks, because hopefully that'll be in the neck area. We'll be able to turn those away. Right, let's carry on.
few more cracks down this end than I would have liked to have seen. But that's okay. Right, I think I need to flatten off this area a little bit here so I can turn the tenon. And we'll figure out the best way to approach this. turned oak for a while and uh, keep on forgetting how hard it is. Right, okay, that should be good enough to be able to put a, a tenon in there, so I'll just quickly mark it out. Okay, we're using the 100 mil jaws for this, uh, and they have quite a deep uh, grab, so I'm going to make the most of that and do quite a deep tenon on this. This little knob I've got sticking out, I'm just going to chisel that off before we turn it around. Should do as nicely. Now before I do turn this round I just want to get rid of the red of the rest of the sapwood and just start making a basic shape but I've still got a very good hold of this thing. Okay we're all sharpened up again. Now I want this vase to have a, a reasonably heavy base with a narrow stem so I think from about just over halfway up I'm going to start angling this in a little bit to clear some of this wood before I turn it around. Still got a bit of sapwood. Oh well. Wow. Sorry, we've still got a bit of sapwood to get rid of there. It's a beautiful pattern around there. A lot of sapwood to get rid of there. definitely going. Now before I get too far in I just want to take down a lot of this neck or well, this bit will be that will be the neck and then I think we'll turn around and just carry on that in that way. just brought me a coffee and in the same breath sort of making a heck of a mess in here. In all truth yes it does look like a tree's exploded. Anyway right uh, as you've noticed I'm just starting to work down to creating a neck space. Now I'm just working down from the top and I will stop when I feel that the balance is right. Usually this kind of thing is about two-thirds and I think we're, we're nearly there. This is it's going to be a lot narrower, so I don't know whether to carry on in this orientation or to turn it round yet. I'm having fun in this orientation, so I shall carry on. Right, let's go and, go and sharpen up again. OK, 
code is find a nice hard shoulder where the top of this, uh, the top of the bottom bit of vase is going to be. So now I've got that, I can just work on getting rid of this sapwood and then we'll turn it around, I promise. stay there for the time being. Okay, right, I'm gonna turn this round. I shall bring you back when we're there. Okay, we've turned around. I'll just carry on creating uh, more of a shape for the neck. I wanna see if I can get past these cracks as well. Looking at the top, what you wanna really have to worry about is this one here, because it seems to go within about an inch of the rim. So let's see how we can get on there. I'm still going to keep this defined neck, but I'm going to be taking it further in and up. big one which I'm worried about. I may have to get all the way past that. There's some mineral deposit in there. Okay, keep going. That's cracked off there. I think that's the end of the uh, the crack. But the grain in there is just absolutely gorgeous. Okay, right, well, a couple more passes to get rid of this. Then I shall feather it in and tidy up this area here. And then we can get onto the exciting bits. Tell you what, I cannot express in words how much joy that those last two cuts were. The surface is just smooth as silk. It was just so smooth and it felt amazing. Right, I'm gonna leave that alone for the time being and see if we can start to even up the shape on this bottom bit. It's not too bad. But uh, it just needs a, a tiny bit of refining and then we'll be ready to start working our, well, I was about to say working our magic, but I haven't got a clue what I'm doing yet, so I'll reserve judgment whether or not it's going to be magic or not. Right, uh, now in terms of design, we are going to have to part this off and whether I take it, put a block underneath to let, take this out to part it off, off where the end is, I'm not sure, because I've left myself unfortunately right on the edge here so it may have to be passed off just above there so we'll probably aim for a, uh, a vase with a base about there so i'll just quickly even up this surface and then we'll get ready for the next bit i think i'm just quickly going to sharpen up again
Okay, that should do that. Now I stopped just before I hit the top on that final cut because there's something about that little rim there that just appealed to me. Whether or not it will still be there at the end, I'm not sure, but uh, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, as they say. Right, I'm gonna go and set up for the next bit. I think I'm gonna quickly grab some lunch as well. And I shall see you back in a second. Okay, now I've just, off camera, just spent a little bit of time sanding this up to about 180 grit, just so it's nice and smooth, ready for the next bit. Now, what I'm gonna try and do is using the Dremel tool is to create lines going along this edge to give it a nice texture. Now, I'm gonna be using the Dremel tool, so it'll need to be able to keep it very, very flat to run it up to the side. And I'm gonna be using a burr, something like this. This is one uh, my wife bought me at Christmas time, which I haven't got around to using yet. Now, the main problem we're gonna have, obviously, is to try and keep the tool running flat and even all the time. So, I've made this little sledge which slides over the top of a tool rest and I can clamp it at the side and that'll give me a nice flat surface. Now I'll show you how this is made. It's no great amazing engineering feat but I'm pleased with it. Right, tool rest slides in there. That closes on it and then clamp it in a normal way. Once that's clamped, then that tool rest is perfectly solid. And that will hopefully then give us a beautifully flat surface to be able to rest on and do our cutting. Now, because this is height adjustable, I need to adjust it so the middle of my burr is always on the same line. So the first thing I'm gonna do is draw lines on here just to help me guide where I need to be. So if I put this tool into this Dremel, see whereabouts on here it touches, and then I can start drawing my lines at that point. Now to help drawing the lines, I am gonna be using the, the spindle lock functionality of the lathe. Right, okay, I found something at the right height. So I'm just gonna be drawing these lines on just as a guide. There we go, got them all. Excellent, right. Okay, I've never used my dribble in this way before. So it's gonna be interesting. Uh, I guess there's nothing really left to do except for uh, give it a go. If it goes badly, then we just get out our big rubber, call the ball gouge, take it off and try it again. Okay, before I start this, I am gonna be wearing a face mask and a face shield and I'll turn the extraction on as well because I'm sure it's gonna kick out a fair amount of dust. Yeah. Okay, that was the first one done. It's not as easy as it looks. I'm sure it didn't look easy either. So I think I'm gonna take a couple more passes of this and then decide. done. Let's have a look at them side by side. <sighs> oh, 
Okay. I think I can live with that. Right, let's go all the way around. It's going to take a while. So, I'll see what happens in the editing. I may bring you back at the end or I may let you speed it all up, but you'll soon find out. Okay, that's not easy. <laughs> Next time I do it, I'm going to build a sledge or something for the, the tool to run on, in, so I can keep it steadier. We've done okay, but uh, I'm sure next time will be better. Now, these cut saw bits, they do work very, very well. They can clog up, but the easiest way to unclog them is just to take them out uh, hold them in uh, a pair of pliers or something like that and just hit the rim, uh, hit the top with a, like a butane torch and it chars and burns all the wood and you can just rub it out with a fine uh, wire brush. So that's good. But apart from that, they did clean. Sorry, it did cut very well. It removed a lot of material. I was quite impressed actually. Right, I'm gonna disassemble this lot and then I'm gonna give this a quick uh, sanding over the top and then we're going to put uh, our ebonizing fluid on. Okay, we're just about ready to start putting the ebonizing solution on. Now most ebonizing solutions, all, all of them I've ever used, have only been in one part. Now this is uh, a new one being developed by uh, Goodwoods. Uh, my friend at Goodwoods, I mentioned him a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the, uh, the Poplar uh, Spalter Poplar Wing Bowl. Anyway, he's made up this, he's come up with the idea himself and he sent me a couple of little trial pots to have a go with. Now, it says clean it off, so we've cleaned it off. Sand to no more than 220 and we've done that. And uh, now we apply part one with a brush or a sponge or a cloth uh, lightly. And when that's done, we go straight ahead and apply part two. We let that sit for a while and wipe off excess and it'll start to darken. Uh, we can repeat the process as many times as we like until the desired effect. Now, apparently you don't put too much on. So I'm gonna start putting it on with a sponge. Oh my goodness. It's fairly instantaneous. Now the way ebonizing fluids work is that there's a chemical in them that uh, combined with the tannins in the wood to make it go dark. Now I've always made my own ebonizing fluid before just with white vinegar and nails or wire wool or anything like that. But uh, he did explain to me exactly what was in this but I can't remember and I didn't understand an awful lot of it anyway. Right, so let's get this on. Now, oak is a, an ideal wood to test this on because it does have an awful lot of tannins naturally in the wood. Another good one to try would be cherry. Now I've taped up the top of this because I don't want it, I want the top to be left natural. So it's a nice contrast to the ebonizing. <laughs> Look at the difference. That's incredible. Right, I'm gonna give this a couple of seconds and then I'll grab another sponge and go on with part two. I can't see it's getting much darker. That's it's black. Okay, this is part two. It's 
absolutely incredible. Okay, right, I'm gonna let this sit overnight to dry properly. And then we'll come back tomorrow, take off the tape at the top, and start finishing this off. Okay, ebonizing went beautifully. I'm really, really happy with the way that's come out, but I'm not happy with my attempt at creating this texture. Now, it was a first attempt, so I'll let myself off a little bit, but I think we can do better. So what I've done is, first of all, I've made another jig from a tool rest, which has a slightly lower surface. It's a thinner piece of wood on top, so I can use my palm router instead. Now, the advantage of using a palm router here is, first of all, I've got this flat plate in the bottom so I can push it in up to the surface of the wood so I can keep a nice even depth. Also flat on the bottom so I can keep it at an even height as well. So we'll give this a go. Right, I'm gonna go and put my face mask on and, and things. And I'll turn the air extraction on and we'll give it a go. If this fails, then we'll figure out what to do next. Okay, now that instantly looks an awful lot better. I think I need to go into it with a bit more confidence than I was, but it does look better. Uh, another thing I need to quickly sort out is I need a stop point on my board. So when I get to the top, it doesn't go any further. So I'll just I'm going to put a little screw in there or put a clamp on to stop me at that point. Okay, that's the stops in place. Let's see if we can finish off this one and then move on to the rest. That's certainly better. A few errors along the way, but uh, again, we're learning. We are learning. Now, I think I don't want to start the process again. I don't necessarily want to, or do I? No, I think we'll call this one an experiment. Right, I'm going to get the ebonizing fluid out again, go over all these areas, and then we'll finish it up. Okay, this time, because I've got deeper holes to put it into, I am going to use a brush rather than a sponge. This is the part one of the solution. When I started this channel, I always wanted the channel to be about experimentation and trying something new. And the main preface of that is to get yourself out of your comfort zone. Don't ever let yourself become complacent. If you become good at something, don't just keep doing it. You know, try and expand yourself, try and do new things. So, this process has been an immense learning curve. And I'm gonna take what I've learned and see how far I can push it, see what else we can create using these methods. Right, I'm gonna quickly go over this with a, a cloth because I've got quite a bit of excess there. Okay, this is the, the second part of the solution. There you go. Right, I'm gonna get another cloth, wipe off the excess, and we'll let this ferment. Why not? Okay, the second lot of uh, 
ebonizing fluid is a time to to sit and dry. So I was going to take off our masking tape and see if it's managed to hold off getting dyed itself. I'm just going to reuse a bit of this because we are going to have to get the steady rest out at some point so there's no point in wasting good tape. Okay there's a little bit of cleaning up going to be going to have to be done there. It shouldn't be too hard. I think I'll have a quick go at sanding that first of all see if it'll come off with sanding but it may have gone a bit deeper so I'll have to uh, take it off with a gouge or something. Yeah, I think just a little gouge across the top there. To, oops, blimey. set up for hollowing I shall bring you back in a second okay we're set up to go in with a, an auger bit uh, I apologize for the sound this makes because it's quite horrendous because uh, we've got the wheels obviously going on these uh, ridges that we've created so it's a bit noisy <laughs> That's the hollowing out done. Now I'm just going to very carefully just flatten off this surface. So I'm thinking about leaving it straight. I might feather this out a little bit, but again, I don't think it needs it. I think just a, a normal hole there will suit the kind of style this vase has. <laughs> set up. Now I've just put a block underneath the tenon in the jaws just to lift, take this away from the uh, from the edge so I can part that off at the very very bottom. Uh, I will be bringing in the tailstock when I do that just to keep it safe uh, but it's fully tight and it's fully secure at the moment. Right the finish I'm going to use is uh, the shellac again because we're not going to get really a chance to rub this in very much apart from on the neck. So this will give us a nice protection and a nice colour as well without having to buff it in. It's really making that ebonising really pop. That is gorgeous. I'll do a couple of coats of this sealer and then we'll put a couple of full strength coats over the top. And when that's all dried we shall part it off. Let that sit for a little while, put a few more coats on and I'll bring you back for the parting off. Okay, that's all done. Now you can clearly see where I've got the bottom of the tenon out of the jaws. It's got a block below it. I've brought up the tail stock to hold it nice and firm. I'm going to slowly part it off and the last bits we're going to do with the handsaw. Send it up and we'll take a look at the finished thing. There we go. Oak vase which has been textured and ebonized. This was a good project for me because it really got me out of my comfort zone. I was doing things I've never done before uh, and trying to learn as I went along and not a hundred percent successful but We've learnt enough to have enough confidence to come into it again 
and do better next time. That's the whole point of this channel. And it's something I've always strived for, is just to try and get myself learning new skills, sharing the experience with you so we can all learn together. Now, initially when I tried the cut sole bit, uh, I was a little naive. Uh, it needed to be held incredibly still to create a straight line. And these bits are, I think they're generally made to be more used freehand. And I'm certainly gonna be doing that with them because they do work very well and they do remove an awful lot of material fairly quickly. And they're also easier to clean, which uh, is a nice feature. Uh, then I moved on to the, uh, the router and the router cut an awful lot better but it still wasn't perfect. I did have it firm against uh, the jig we made and that helped me cut a good bottom line, but I wasn't, there was nothing stopping at the top. I never saw often, I just caught a little catch and it just took it up into the, the top layer, which is a bit of a shame, but again, we're learning. And that's the whole point of it. Uh, the ebonizing, that went fantastically. That really is a beautiful product and I will be using that again. If you are interested in, the ebonizing fluid and want to try it yourself and I'll leave a link in the description below where you can get it from. Uh, the oak itself is absolutely gorgeous. There's some grain in here which is just absolutely stunning and I'll leave a couple of uh, close-up shots of that in the at the end of the video. Right anyway, uh, over the last few weeks I've been selling a few items on eBay because uh, well due to lots of people asking me where they can buy my stuff from. Now as a rule I don't usually sell it but I have been recently because of the overwhelming pressure that people have been putting on me. So anyway uh, the last auctions have just about ended so I'm going to put three more up. Now, I don't know if there's going to be many more after this but uh, we'll see how things go. Anyway so I'm going to be selling or listing uh, the textured and coloured ash bowl that we did a couple of weeks ago. The Sequoia Bowl. Now we made two of these, one with a natural edge and this is the other one. Now some of the grain in this Sequoia is absolutely beautiful. We've got some fantastic rippling in there. And the last one we're going to be listing is the Laburnum Vase that we made last week. Now all of these are going to be listed on eBay. They're all going no reserve from a 99 pence start or something like that and we can ship worldwide as well through the eBay International Shipping Programme. All money that's been raised so far, uh, and from these as well, it's all put back into the channel. You know, I've been spending quite a bit recently on some very, very amazing pieces of wood, which you're going to be seeing turned hopefully in the very near future. So I'm not doing this to line my own pockets. I'm doing this to hopefully share with you with the quality of wood that we can turn together. Anyway, that's enough from me. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. If you have enjoyed it, I'd appreciate a like and subscribe and thumbs up and all that kind of thing. And if you leave a comment as well, then you're going to be entered into the giveaway when we get to 25,000 subscribers. Uh, but apart from that, thank you very much indeed. And I shall see you next time. Thank you.